Sa save it, save it, save it for later.
morning church great to see you this morning my name is Caleb Hong I'm the lead pastor here at Faith United Methodist Church I'm joined by our lay worship leader for the weekend Sarah Kabicki as we uh, begin our service let's say our mission statement which you can see up on the screen Faith United Methodist Church is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship education, mission, and fellowship. So today is the second weekend of Lent. Lent is the season of spring cleaning, spiritual spring cleaning, before the celebration of Easter. Last week, we reminded each other that God longs for us to live with big faith, this complete confidence and trust in God that carries us through the good and the bad times of life. This week, we're going to talk about the importance of practical teaching, how important it is to apply scriptures to our lives. If you're a guest visiting Faith for the first time, welcome. We're so glad to see you. We invite you to stop by the Welcome Center following service for a gift that we have for you. Uh, For any children who are worshiping with us in a few minutes, we're going to invite you to come forward and hang out with Miss Jamie. Uh, And then after that, you'll go back to your seats Uh, because this is the first weekend of the month. And also a reminder for any parents that uh, nursery care is available for uh, infants through five years old on Sunday mornings. Uh, If you are worshiping with us online, we welcome you here. Uh, Thanks for being here. Uh, We want to invite you to fill out a virtual connection card. You can write your name and also any prayer requests that you have. And also a heads up, we're going to have communion. We're going to celebrate communion a little later. So if you have any bread or juice of any kind at home, we invite you to collect those elements and uh, we'll bless those as well as the elements here at a little later in the service. For everyone who's here in the sanctuary today, we invite you to uh, fill out an attendance card. What color is it today? Orange, pink, whatever color you have, (laughs) salmon, okay, Uh, whatever color you got, Uh, if you would fill it out, just, you know, even your name, and again, if you have any prayer requests, you can fill that out there. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, It's a good day to worship God. Uh, Please rise if you're able, and let's sing our opening hymn. Let me hear how the children stood round here. 
How are you doing today? Good. Good. Oh, that's so excellent to hear. Well, today I want to tell a little bit of a story, and I'm going to use my guitar to do it. And <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever heard this song, but have you ever heard a song about a wise man and a foolish man and a rock and some sand? Oh, you've you've heard of a rock and a story? Oh, okay. Well, we're going to tell a story about a wise man and a foolish man. Have you ever built something before? Like, maybe like with a hammer? Have you ever used a hammer? No, but I made thousands of things out of Legos, yeah. Oh, that's a good thing to build. Well, I'm going to need you to help me out with some motions. And the motion I have is this for build. But if you want to do a Lego build, then you could go like this if you wanted. So when we talk about building, you can either go like this or you can go like this. Okay? And so I'm going to talk about a wise man building something and a foolish man building something. And then there's a surprise at the end of the song. And uh, I'll give you a hint. At the end of the song, you'll have to go like this. So we'll see how it goes. I think that maybe some people out here might know the song. And so maybe they might be able to help me out. What do you think? What do you think? Do you think you can do that? If you know the song, you can sing along with me. <clears throat> the wise man built his house upon the rock. His house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. All right, that's one story. We've got a guy, we've got his house. Where is it built? Where is it built? <laughs> In the rainforest. <laughs> on the rock, man, on the rock. All right, now it's the foolish man's turn. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. And the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splat. <laughs> it went splat. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so in the Bible, Jesus talks about these two, two people, and they build their houses on a rock. And what's the second one? Where does the foolish man build his house? The rainforest. Not again. <laughs> he built it on the sand on the sand. What do we know that's different about a rock and about sand? 
Hmm, are those the same? <gasps> Quicksand would sink your house. Yeah. Oh, it would be too big to put holes in your house. But a rock, a rock is something that's really sturdy, right? It's really sturdy and strong. And sand, it kind of moves around a lot. Have you ever gone in, in the sand and tried to run in the sand? No, but I only feel like it's quicksand. Yeah, it's, it's too hard to run sometimes because the sand, it moves and it shakes and it moves. So this story is all about how there are things in our lives that it's not a great idea to build our lives on because they aren't as strong as what living our lives like God would want us to live is. Like, do you think it's a good idea to build your life on mm, tacos? <laughs> I mean, I love tacos. I think that that's what's for my lunch today. But I love tacos, and you can have tacos in your life, but that's not the most important thing in life, right? I, th I think that there are more important things on li in life. So when we're living our lives, sometimes we need to think about how maybe instead of living on our lives on things that aren't very strong and things that kind of go away and they move when we are with them, then... Uh, that's not a great way to live our lives. But if we build our lives on something really strong, what's something really strong? Bricks. Yes, bricks are strong. But loving our family and our friends, that's a really strong thing to build our life on. The strongest thing on the planet is a rock, though. The strongest thing on the planet is a rock. Yeah, we got to build our lives on that. That's a volcano. A volcano. No, a mountain. A mountain. Oh, so many good ideas. Let's go ahead and sing our song one more time. And remember, let's build. Build, build, build. And this time you can add when it rains. The rains come down. And the floods came up. Let's try it. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splat. Good job. You can go back to your seats. us back to VBS days, didn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to begin by sharing prayer requests that have been submitted over the past week. The flowers on the altar today are given by Sharon Novotny, and they are in memory of the 10th anniversary of her husband Donald's passing. We'll keep Sharon and her family in our prayers. We have a number of joys to share. Praise God for the gift of worship as we continue our Lenten journey. Praise God for the Lenten small groups that are now underway. May God use these times to deepen our faith and to prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter. 
Praise God for the faithful volunteers who will serve communion to our homebound members and friends in the coming week. Praise God for a wonderful time at yesterday's Oak Forest Flood of Parade. Thank you to everyone who donated candy, and particularly thank you, Barb Hendrickson is with us this morning, who is chair of our publicity committee, and to everyone who walked and also gave out the candy and freebies. Congratulations to Greg Rossler. Greg, um, let me lift up praise for his admission into the master's degree of school psychology program at Governor State University. We also have a number of concerns that have been raised. <clears throat> let us pray for families who are mourning the loss of loved ones in both Ukraine and in Russia and a peaceful end to the war that has now entered its second year. Let us pray for our neighbors in Syria and Turkey who are rebuilding their homes and communities after the devastating earthquakes. Let us pray for the safety of police officers, firefighters, and first responders who put themselves in harm's way each and every day. Let us pray for all who grieve the passing of family and friends. My sister Jan and I are asking prayers for healing for our cousins who are sisters, Marilyn and Rhonda. Jim and Lita Hudik asking prayers for their cousin, for Carol Hudik Skos and adopted children who passed on 3 4 of 23. Jeannie Lang is asking prayers for a friend, for Larry Palmer, Kevin's dad, who is back in the hospital with complications regarding his lung cancer. Debbie and Joan Grutzmacher ask prayers for their mother, Rutha, who is hospitalized with blood clots in her lungs. Sue Rossler asks for prayers for brother-in-law, Jim, who had cancer surgery this past Thursday. Terry Velton is asking prayers for friend Keith, who is wrestling with some significant health issues. Karen Bales is asking prayers for God's blessings for her friend, Karen, I'm sorry, Helen. Jackie Conaderis asks prayers for Joey's grandfather, Tony, who is preparing for another round of treatment for cancer. Jeannie Bellick asks prayers for Don, a family member who is having extensive back surgery next week. Debbie DiLorenzo asks prayers for John, who is struggling with health issues, and for Evan, who is recovering from eye surgery. Let us pray for the health and recovery of all who are sick, hospitalized, and undergoing treatments. We continue to pray for the ongoing health and recovery of Jill Damro, Maureen Califat, Mary Ellen Anderson, Bob Fulton, Herb Bone, and others that are on our hearts. And now let us pray. Holy God, creator of all that is, please hear our prayers. There are chasms in our lives and deep valleys that separate us from one another and from you. We confess that we have actively and passively allowed these gaps to grow. Forgive us, Lord, and free us from our sin. Help us to fix our eyes on the life-giving power of the cross. Gracious God, you call us to a reconciled life, to healed relationships, you invite us to experience wholeness with each other and with you. Mend us, we pray, and make us new creations through the power and love of Jesus Christ. As we journey through Lent, help us to respond to your invitation to live by faith and not by sight. Help us to deepen our trust and confidence in your word. Where you call us to go, help us go. When you call us to be bold, help us to be bold. And in the faith, face of injustice and oppression, 
please help us to serve as your hands and feet of mercy and compassion. Empower us to shine your light in the midst of darkness and equip us to speak your words of life in the midst of death. Help us to freely share the love and grace that you so freely share with us each day. Mighty healer, we pray for your healing spirit to bless all who are hurting and who are sick. Please strengthen those who are recovering from sickness and comfort those who grieve the loss of loved ones, the loss of health, the loss of hope. Breathe your Holy Spirit on all who wrestle with doubt, depression, and despair. And finally, Lord, we praise you for the gift of this day as we journey as pilgrims on the way to Calvary, help us to draw near to you. Help us to hear your still, small voice. Make us more like you in big and small ways every day. And now, holy God, even as you heard the prayers we lifted aloud, please hear the prayers that we lift up in the silence of our hearts. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Please rise if you are able for the reading of today's scripture. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. I believe at the, the end of the, the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we observe people and as we listen to people tell their stories, it seems that these five things show up in everybody's story that God uses to build their faith. When you read the Old and the New Testament, the story of the scripture is God trying to build into people an extraordinary, out of the box, over the top, are you kidding me, kind of confidence in Him. The people you choose to surround yourself with have the potential to impact your spirituality. You may have a really bad attitude, but you know what? Disciplines are beneficial even if you have a bad attitude. You just do what you know how to do, and then you trust your Heavenly Father to do what only He can do. Pain and suffering are not the exception to the rule. They are part of the story. Your faith is extraordinarily important to your Heavenly Father. So last week we started our Lenten series, Five Things God Uses to Grow Your Faith. And uh, it's based on the small group curriculum and teaching series by Andy Stanley. The main idea of the series is this. God wants you to have big, audacious, bold faith and live with this big faith every day. God doesn't want to just grow a little bit of faith. God wants to grow big faith in you and in me. Faith like Abraham, Esther, Moses, Mary, like the unnamed Roman centurion, God wants us to have big faith, total confidence in God's love and work in our lives 24-7, seven, seven days a week. So last week, uh, we started with an overview of the five faith catalysts that Andy Stanley offers uh, that he suggests that God uses to grow us in faith. And these five faith catalysts are practical teaching, pivotal relationships, private disciplines, personal ministry, and pivotal circumstances. Now, before we continue, I want to encourage you to take full advantage of the growth opportunities in this sermon series and in this Lenten season. While the worship series, worship services, and the preaching will be amazing, I hope, uh, there's also a level of lear learning that you can do just in discussions with each other in small groups. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to sign up for a small group. We're offering six small groups this Lent. They meet at different times, different days, different locations throughout the week. You can find the sign-up sheets in the lobby and also... Uh, on our website. If none of these groups fit into your schedule, take a book and grab two or three friends and form a group of your own. Or take a book and just use these books as a devotion for yourself throughout the course of the week. I know that God will bless you and meet you and grow you in faith during this season. Now here's the outline for today's message. I'm going to start with the scripture again, as Sarah mentioned, that is the conclusion of Jesus' most famous sermon. And then we're going to consider how God uses the first of the five catalysts, practical teaching, to grow big faith in us. Let's pray, and we'll begin. God, you are so gracious, and you invite us to receive living water. We thank you that you know us inside and out. Thank you that you have been walking with us throughout our weeks. 
and we thank you that you are here now. So would you open our eyes to see? Would you open our ears to hear? Would you soften our hearts to receive the gift of your word for us this day? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture is the conclusion of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes, the statements of blessings, and it ends with today's scripture, which is the parable of the wise and the foolish builders at the end of Matthew chapter 7. In between the Beatitudes and this parable are some of Jesus' most practical and controversial and provocative teachings. For example, it's in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus commands us not to judge others, lest we be judged. It's in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus calls us to love our enemies. And when someone strikes you on the left cheek, Jesus says, offer your right cheek. Jesus says, if someone takes your coats, offer them your shirt. This is where Jesus expands on our understanding of the Ten Commandments, especially the ones against adultery and murder. So Jesus says, do not condemn, even insult other people with your words. Because when you condemn and insult other people, even verbally, you are murdering them in your hearts. And Jesus says, do not lust after people. Because when you lust after other people, you are committing adultery with them in your hearts. It's in the Sermon on the Mount where we hear Jesus' words to ask, to seek, to knock. To not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough concerns of its own. This is where we hear the golden rule, which many of you know, comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. All of these teachings and so much more, they are jam-packed into the Sermon on the Mount. Again, Matthew's chapters 5, 6, 7. If you've never read these words or you haven't read them in a while, I would encourage you, take a look. Read it during the course of this week, during the season of Lent. Not that they're going to make you feel good. I promise you they will not make you feel good. (laughs) They'll actually challenge you, confuse you. But it's important for us to know Jesus' most famous teachings, to read them, and to wrestle with his words. So then after offering this series of very practical and provocative teachings, Jesus closes his most famous sermon with the words that Sarah read for us just a few minutes ago. Jesus says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew. It beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, they'll be like the foolish man who who built his house on sand. The rain fell, floods came, the winds blew, beat against the house, and... It fell, and great was its fall. Some of you uh, knew uh, that this parable is so famous that it got the kid's song uh, that uh, Miss Jamie sang for us. In case you forgot it or you want to hear it again, I have a video. Here we go. (laughs) So listen again to the words of Jesus. Jesus says this. Everyone who hears his teaching and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on a rock. Because when the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew, this house did not fall. It did not shake. It did not even waver. Why? Because it was built on this very, very solid foundation. On the other hand, Everyone, Jesus said, who hears his teachings and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who built his house on sand. Sure, it looks nice when the sun is out and when the skies are blue and the birds are chirping, but when the rains fall and the winds blow 
and the waters fall, the, the waters rise, this house will fall because the foundations are weak, because the house was built on nothing but sand. If I had to summarize Jesus' point in this parable, it would be these words. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just listen to it, apply it. Can we say that together? Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just apply it. Good. Jesus is clear. It's not enough for us simply to hear his teaching. If God is going to grow big faith in us, if we're going to build our lives on this solid and secure foundation that can withstand the Category 5 storms of life, and y'all may have already experienced those Category 5 storms of life in the past, Jesus says we've got to put God's Word into practice in our lives. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just listen to it, apply it. Andy Stanley points out that Christian faith in North America these days is so watered down that many people believe that attendance is what God wants. Consistent church attendance is what God desires. And just uh, we think just waking up, going to church, if possible, staying awake through the sermon, that's God's ultimate goal, right? As if getting people to step into a building was God's great mission. And of course, that's far from the truth. Jesus says, what God longs for is not attendance, but action. It's not that we become Bible trivia champions, but that we have enough trust to put even the few words that we know and apply them to our lives. Brilliant, life-changing, soul-renewing teachings remain useless and lifeless words until they are applied. Think about it this way. When we hear the words of Jesus, it's like we're receiving this bag of precious seeds. But what good are seeds if they are not planted what seeds what will happen to the seeds if they just remain in the seed bag stored in the shed will they ever grow and bear fruit the answer is no or think about it this way when we hear jesus teaching it's like receiving life saving life transforming medicine but what good is this medicine if we don't take it can we experience the healing power of this miraculous medicine if it's never taken out of the prescription bottle? Or think about exercise and nutrition. You know, I started January 2023 with a confession to you all that I needed to eat better and exercise. That was my honest intention about a month and a half ago. So after that sermon, I watched some uh, exercise videos on YouTube. I even ordered new shoes from Amazon. But can I confess that my health did not improve in the first six weeks of 2023? Not in January, not in the first half of February. Why? Because my intention never translated into meaningful action. My intentions never went beyond watching some YouTube videos and ordering new shoes. When intention remains just intentions, or when seeds sit on a shelf, or when medicine remains unopened in a medicine cabinet, they are useless. On the other hand, for the last uh, two weeks, I made it a goal to exercise, eat healthier, to eat my final meal earlier in the day. I even started to walk two to three miles a day every day for five days a week. And after just two weeks, can I tell you that I am a leaner, meaner, pastoring, fighting machine? I am, I am, I'm feeling it, right? After just two weeks. Thank you. No promises, but <laughs> anyway, that's, that's uh, what I'm working on. More, more importantly, my pants feel less tight, so that's good news. But <laughs> now I'm far from my goal, from my dream of six-pack abs and buns of steel. That's my goal. I've told you this, right? That's my goal. But positive change does not happen with good intentions alone. Amen? 
positive change, whether it's physically, spiritually, mentally, relationally, emotionally, financially, whatever it might be, positive change does not happen when we, until we turn intention into action. It doesn't happen until we apply God's word to our lives. Don't just listen to it, do it. Don't just hear it, apply it. So back to Jesus' parable. I want us to notice that the difference between the wise and foolish builders is not that one heard the lesson and the other did not. Both heard the message. Both were there with Jesus. Both heard these life-giving, life-transforming words. The difference is one acted on it and the other did not. One person trusted and applied Jesus' words to their life, and the other simply stored Jesus' words on a shelf. Jesus says, if we want to be wise and build our lives on a solid and secure foundation, one that, we can, that can withstand the Category 5 storms of life, then we need to trust and apply the words. Don't just hear his teaching. Apply his teaching to our everyday lives. This past Tuesday, I attended a clergy gathering in Sycamore, Illinois. Now, I looked uh, forward, I look forward to these clergy gatherings, but then, uh, because it's gatherings of preachers, I never want to stay all that long. I look forward to them. I never want to stay too long. Too many people there are preachy. That's just the fact. Or they're searching for preaching ideas. I'm one of them. So I was talking about my sermon uh, this week, and I shared with a friend that I'm preaching on the parable of the wise and foolish builders. I even sang the kid's song so just, just so it would get in his head too. Just, you know, because I was like that. My friend, he heard me, he heard the, the bit of the song, and he affirmed just the value and the significance of this passage. And then after a pause, he actually got serious. And he shared that his marriage had been on the rocks for the last few years. Now that the kids were out of the house, it was a make it, break it moment. He and his wife, they talked openly about divorce. They said, this is going to end if we can't mend our marriage. So last summer in 2021, they attended a Christian couples retreat that some friends had recommended. They also started going to uh, marriage counseling together. He shared the last six months have been really, really difficult. It's been really, really hard. There's been a lot of baggage to work through. There's been unresolved conflicts that needed to be addressed. There have been past hurts that needed to be forgiven on both sides. But he added this, there has been a clear change in their relationship. Today, they have hope for a future together. Today, they have new tools and new ways that they handle conflicts and address adversity. The key to the change is not that they they simply attended a retreat or they're going to counseling. The key, my friend said, is that they were applying Jesus' teachings. They were applying the lessons that they learned. They were putting into action Jesus' words about forgiveness, reconciliation, healing, and restored relationships. They were putting those words into practice, and this made all the difference. In another conversation that I had this week, I was speaking with a friend here at our church who went through Financial Peace University. Some of you went through this as well. Uh, Financial Peace University, uh, very uh, important class that talks about biblically grounded financial principles. So he and his wife went through the class and then they applied these uh, biblically grounded financial principles to their lives. And they even set the long-term goal of becoming homeowners, homeowners. These principles, he said, were not easy to follow. Habits are hard to change. At times, there were just moments and there were months when money was tight and life was very uncomfortable. However, he said this, because they stuck with these healthy financial principles, because they had changed their financial habits for the better, they were able to accomplish their dream, and today they are homeowners. Isn't that awesome? They're homeowners, yeah. 
And he added this, they would not be homeowners if all they did was listen to that seminar. They would not be homeowners unless they took those principles and applied it to their lives. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just listen to it, apply it. When we apply biblical teaching to our everyday lives, we are inviting God to grow big faith in us. I shared last week that I grew up in a Christian household. My father uh, was the pastor of small immigrant churches. Therefore, my mother, sister, and I, we were the not really voluntary, voluntary staff. That's who we were. That's our official designation. Not really voluntary, voluntary staff. So I grew up doing all kinds of things around the church. But all of this was done out of obedience to my parents. I was really active in the church. I did all kinds of stuff, right? But there was no faith in God involved. There was no relationship with God to be had. So I go off to college and I had this decision to make. What was I going to do with a faith that I had inherited? What was I going to do with a faith of my parents? And oddly enough, I went to this a very liberal, <laughs> liberal arts college in central Iowa. And in my first few weeks away from home, God sent Christian college students into my life. Whoa. Uh, one of them happened to be a Korean-American United Methodist from Iowa, from the state of Iowa. I met him once in my senior year of high school at a Christian youth camp. We met at the school. He invited me right away to teach Sunday school with him at the local United Methodist Church. I did. And then he invited me to join a, a Bible study that he was leading in his dorm room once a week. And so I went. It was in these Bible studies that I honestly studied the Bible for the first time. There was no pressure from family, no pressure from church members. It was just me and a group of other goofy college students who were curious about the Bible and wanted to read and wrestle with the teachings of God and the words of Jesus. And can I tell you, in this environment, that first year of college, Jesus and the Bible came to life. It was in these studies that I came to know Jesus personally. It was in these times that I fell in love with Jesus. And it was by the end of my freshman year of college that I chose to trust and follow Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. Why? Because I got to know him through these Bible studies. Here's what made these Bible studies more than just intellectual exercises. After our reading, after our discussions, after our disagreements, whatever it might be, we ended every study with application. After reading and wrestling with the scriptures, even if we didn't agree, we would ask each other the same question every week. Now what? Now what? Yes, we've read, re yes, we've discussed, yes, we've you know, pulled all of the, the different kind of contacts and other kind of, kind of conversations into our, our conversation with each other, but now what? How is God speaking to us? How is God inviting us to respond? How can we apply the teachings that we heard and learned to our lives today? The Bible was never really easy to understand. The scriptures, when they were easy to understand, I found them hard to apply. But we made it a point as a group to trust God enough to apply God's word to our lives. Not that all of us were even Christians, but we said we're going to trust God enough at least to try it and to see if God's promises were true. And in doing so, we invited God to adjust our habits to reshape our thinking, to influence our decisions, to impact our relationships with friends, with family, even with our finances. Whenever we ask that question, now what? We invited God to grow big faith in us. So here's the application for you and I this weekend. If you are serious about allowing God to grow big faith in your life, read the Bible. It might be the Sermon on the Mount. It might be another part of the Scripture. Read the Bible and then put 
the words into action. Read the Bible and then put the words into action. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just listen to it, apply it. Those of you who are in small groups, you may discuss a Bible verse or a specific teaching of Jesus that you applied to your life that prepared you for an unexpected storm. Perhaps it's a teaching about relationships, about how we speak with each other. Maybe it's a, a, a teaching about how we handle our finances or about anxiety that we wrestle with, whatever it might be. What are those teachings that you've applied to your life that has grounded you in the midst of life storms. You know, mine is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. So after John 3, 16, these were, I think, some of the earliest verses that I ever memorized. And the only reason I memorized them is because a Sunday school teacher... Uh, challenged our class, I think I was in like fourth or fifth grade, and our Sunday school teacher challenged us, if you memorize these scriptures, I will give you some candy the next week. So I said, I'll do it then, right? <laughs> you don't have to say anything beyond candy. I will memorize these scriptures. And so I did. I memorized this one, and uh, our teacher did you know, some other verses as well, but this one really stuck with me. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 goes like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Little did I know at the time how important that scripture would be for me, because throughout my life, especially at critical junctures, in those moments when life, the storms felt like the category five storms of my life, these verses served as spiritual anchors for me. They grounded me when friends or family or I got sick. They assured me in those moments and seasons of life when I felt anxious and afraid about the future. They guided me when I graduated from college and I was torn about where to go next. They gave me hope in that season of my life when I was shuttling my father between home and hospital and nursing home over and over and over again. They offered me comfort when my father and other loved ones passed away. When I first memorized these scriptures as a child, my only incentive was to satisfy my sweet tooth. But as I grew older, these verses served as part of the foundation that kept me strong, that kept me connected with God, that gave me hope and kept me from falling Friends, I invite us, let's be people of big faith. Let's allow God to grow big faith in us. How? Read the Bible and put it to action. Don't just hear it, do it. Don't just listen to it, apply it to your life. Let's pray. And with your eyes closed in just a moment of silence and prayer, I'd ask you, what is a teaching, a scripture, what is a promise that God is inviting you to apply today? If you are going through one of the storms of life, what is that teaching, that scripture, that promise that God is inviting you to trust and apply to your life today? We thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you that you know us right where we are. We thank you that no matter how great the storms that we might be experiencing, no matter how much it's raining, no matter how uh, devastating the, the, the floods and the winds may feel like, we thank you that while life changes, you are unchanging. that you invite us to build our lives not on tacos, not on money, not on fame, not on things that are sand. But you invite us to build our lives on you. So thank you again that you meet us this day and you love us enough 
to invite us to trust you, to trust you enough to not only hear your words of life, but to apply it, to not only hear your prescriptions for healing, but to take it, to not only receive your words of healing and hope, but to receive it into our hearts. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that your words are true. And thank you that you trust us enough that you offer us this invitation to experience the life-changing power of your word. So thank you for this time. Thank you for each other. Thank you for your goodness. Meet us right where we are. Help us to apply your words to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's interesting, uh, 2,000, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was with his disciples and he taught them something and he gave them a command. And because they not only heard it, but applied it, we're still doing this sacrament today. 2,000 years ago, Jesus invited his disciples. It was the night before he would offer up his life for us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, hey, let's go up to an upper room. Let's share the Passover meal together. I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it so you know and you remember the sacrifice I'm going to make for you. The healing that I will offer to you. The hope that I will give to you. And because they not only heard Jesus, but they applied it again and again, this is why we share this sacrament today. Let's pray together. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You made us in your image and you made us well. You loved us from the beginning, from the moment we were born. Your love for us did not change. And even when we turned away from you, even when we went our own way, even when we turned our backs on you, you never turned your backs on us. You love us right where we are, and you invite us over and over to come back, to return, to trust you, to walk in your footsteps, to apply your words of life to our life. And so even on the night before your death, you invited your disciples to an upper room, and there you took bread and you blessed it and you broke it. And you gave it to your disciples and you said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, Jesus took the cup. Again, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. May your Holy Spirit rest on these elements of bread and juice, not only those here, but those at home. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ. Would you make us one with you, one with each other, and one in mission into all the world, declaring that you love them, that you care for them, and that you will invite us to experience a full and abundant life. So Lord, help us to receive you again this day. Thank you for meeting us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite our communion stewards to come forward, if we can have the two of them come forward. Uh, for everyone else, uh, a few words of instruction. What we'll do is we'll invite everyone to come forward uh, from the back to the front, down the center aisle. When you come forward, receive the elements. 
take the elements. If you'd like, you can pray here at the kneeling rails and then return to your seats by way of the side aisles. Uh, don't eat the elements just yet. Just receive it and say a prayer and prepare yourself because once everyone has been served, we'll share the meal together. The table is ready. We invite you to come and receive. And if you're not able to come forward physically, it's okay. At the very end of this, I'll ask you to raise your hand and we'll bring elements to you. All right, so the table is ready. Come and receive. to come up, if you just raise your hands, we'll come and bring elements to you. Everyone has it? In the AV booth? Got it? So we're here, and uh, we're at the table that Jesus has set, and he invites us to share in this meal together. So if you're able to peel back 
the thin, clear plastic layer that will give you access to the wafer. I'll invite you to do so. And then hold the wafer for a moment. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. And then if you would peel back the tin layer, accessing the juice, be careful. Friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray again together. We thank you, Lord, that you meet us today. Just as you fed and cared for, washed the feet and encouraged your disciples 2,000 years ago in that upper room, as we share in this meal as you commanded us to do, you meet us. So thank you for your presence with us, your hope for us, your love for us. Would you help us to receive? Would you give us the courage to respond? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will continue our worship service with an invitation to offer gifts and tithes. Giving at faith is always an opportunity, never an obligation. We give as an expression of our gratitude and our desire to share in God's work of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If you have an offering prepared today, we invite you to place them in the offering basket at the entrance of the sanctuary. Another option is to give online through our church website or electronically through your bank. You can also mail your offering directly to the church. Here are other ways that you can share in the ministries of faith. The first is intercessory prayer class. Dr. Jim Sandberg, who is Faith's Director of Congregational Care, will lead three classes on intercessory prayer starting this Sunday today at 1015. The location will be in room 8. The goal of the class is to teach us how to pray on behalf of others. And if you have questions, you can contact Pastor Jim. Pi Day. The Fellowship Committee invites you to celebrate Pi Day with your church family. Bring your favorite pie, whether it's a dessert, a pot pie, a pizza pie, to share. Also bring your favorite games, cards, board games, yard games. The date will be next Sunday, March 12, at 1230 here in the fellowship hall if you're uh, ha if you have questions you can contact Nancy Carver or Nancy Clemenson who are the fellowship committee chairs the third is Easter flowers it's time to order Easter flowers for Easter Sunday you can see the order form in this weekend's bulletin or contact the church office all orders and payments are due Monday March 13 Fourth is that of offering envelopes. Thank you for your patience for the 2023 offering envelopes. Unfortunately, due to problems with the printing company, we will not be able to have personalized envelopes this year. We ask everyone to use the general offering envelopes and to write your name and the envelope number, if you know it, on that envelope. Contact the church office if we can mail you a set of general offering envelopes. If you have any questions, you can contact Sue Ead or Lois White, who are our Faith UMC financial secretaries. Fifth, our home communion team. Each month, Faith sends out a team of people to offer communion to our homebound family and friends. When? It's during the week following the first Sunday of the month. If you'd like to learn more about this ministry, contact our Director of Congregational Care, Pastor Jim. And now we have an announcement regarding Monday Thursday from Bob Lazars. Well, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm here searching for talent. <laughs> Diane Barnett and I have decided to try to put on a Monday Thursday drama. This year, Monday Thursday is April 6th. 
Uh, anyway, we've uh, picked a uh, contemporary uh, drama that's a contemporary twist on the Last Supper. Uh, let's see, Last Supper, there was uh, Jesus and the apostles. And oh my gosh, I need 13 characters here. So all you closet uh, thespians, come on out. Uh, contact me or Diane. We'll be out in the lobby after the service. So uh, come on out, have some fun, and uh, help us praise God. I've got parts for men and women. It's, a, like I said, contemporary twist, so there's plenty of parts for women. And uh, what? And we have uh, also a teenage boy and a teenage girl. So uh, come on out, have some fun, and help us praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let us pray over our offerings. God of unwavering love, you hold nothing back in your love for us, not even your son. As we offer you our gifts and tithes, lead us away from our tendency to hold back and worry that there will not be enough. Help us to live as wise people who put your words into practice and build our house on the rock. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise if you are able for our closing song. we do uh, each week as we close our service we want to thank everyone who uh, offers their gifts and time and talents to make our services possible we want to thank our greeters our ushers our welcome center our security we want to thank our AV team our Sunday school teachers our nursery care attendants our lay worship leaders our musicians singer choir flautist did I say that correctly flautist if you would join me in thanking all of them also our communion stewards, right? We have so many. If you would now turn to your neighbor, make a sign of the heart and say, God loves you and so do I. <laughs> uh, so I, I heard this phrase a number of years back and it goes like this. It is better for you to know one scripture and to apply it than for you to know a thousand scriptures and apply none. Better to know one and apply it than to know a thousand and apply none. I don't know what scripture God is putting on your hearts. Apply it. Trust God. See the goodness of God in your life. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay.